So, Dad, how come there are two kinds of food then? Well, there, there shouldn't be two kinds of food. I mean, you go to the grocery store, you're being sold two kinds of food. You're being sold labels based on fear. But really, do you think the organic food is, is somehow different that for you than other food that's grown? I mean, it just comes down to knowledge and understanding and a lot of fear-based propaganda. Okay, but Dad, the organic movement is about having an alternative to like industrialized agriculture, you know, food for profit, right? Industrialized agriculture. Yeah. Really? Nick, when's the last time you were on a farm? Like a, a farm of size, anything that produces... Okay, 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 like, okay, I mean, okay, seriously. okay, 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 okay. Hi, my name is Nick Syke, and lately I've had some questions surrounding what's true about our food. My dad's a baby boomer who grew up on a farm, and he's worked in agriculture all of his life. Understanding each other isn't easy at the best of times, and when it comes to food, we need science as a common language if we're going to make any sense of the other's point of view. And that's the goal. Join me while I annoy this guy with my skepticism as we search for the answers to my questions about our food. Welcome to Learn GMO. My dad is convinced that if we all knew more about farming, everyone would feel differently about it. Well, the division of labor really is about people focusing in on what they're good at so other people can do the same. And agriculture has been the shining example today. Okay, okay, I know where he's going with this, and it'll take him five minutes to get it out. Thanks to technology, in 10,000 years, we've gone from 100% hunter-gatherers to 50% farmers, to the point where today, only 2% of North Americans grow all of the food while the other 98% of us do whatever we do. But I've traveled through a lot of developing countries and they're still closer to the 50-60% ratio North America was at in the 1800s. Most people here have hands-on experience as farmers. But here, me and my friends find healthy, sustainable food to be a high priority, but other than buying organic or a general suspicion about GMOs, Almost none of us knows that much about our food or how it actually grows. Since 98% of us don't have any agricultural experience, it makes sense that we're concerned about what we don't know. That's my entire reason for doing this project. We'd like to know more about our food, and we try, but what's the truth? Everybody has a different opinion about this organic GMO thing. Tell me, what, uh, what have you heard of GMO foods? I've, I've heard a lot of, about GMO foods. My, my opinion is a bit varied on it. Okay. It sounds very unnatural to me. Mm -hmm. um, and like you're just messing with natural processes. You try to stick to organic, but uh, the challenges of uh, sitting around reading the labels and digging through it, that's the harder part. Okay, those are opinions of people like you and me, but my dad and I agreed that we use validated science so what do scientists think about this whole organic GMO debate? It's hard to keep up. It's hard for me to keep up, and this is my area of expertise. So I think it's very difficult, and I think uh, people read media. There's all kinds of things on the internet, uh, things that say good things, things that say bad things, and people don't know what to believe. Speaking on behalf of consumers, I think that the GMO thing is just like a little freaky for people. It, it strikes, you know, why would you eat something so new and think it was safe? No. What do you mean new? You think carrots are new? Carrots are GMO? Nick, you really need to read a book. So it turns out, carrots used to be yellow, white, and purple too. Dutch farmers wanted to honor King William of Orange, and if my title was a color, I'd be into matching food too. Perfect. Neat story, Dad, but how is that GMO? Well, if you're selecting for orange carrots, you're selecting by gene traits. It means that over time, you're actually selectively engineering the carrots to be orange. I'd never thought of breeding as engineering. Hmm. Time for some historical science. So I fell down the research rabbit hole to see if we've messed with other foods too. And it turns out nature isn't sadistic enough to create broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, or kale. That was all us, centuries ago. We started with wild cabbage and wound up with at least four equally unappetizing options, so bad example. But apples started tiny, wheat inedible, peaches were sour to begin with, Watermelons were bitter. Basically, you name it. And apparently humans bred, or I guess engineered it by tweaking an existing plant to be better in some way. One of the best examples of this is our modern corn. According to a really well-researched book I read by Margaret Visser called Much Depends on Dinner, life is crazy dependent on corn. Like, say goodbye to pretty much everything in this supermarket if we didn't have it. It has that many uses. But North America's favorite crop wasn't always so useful. That apparently took some doing. Dr. Lameau again. I mean, it started as this uh, tiny little grain that's so hard that you have to break it with a hammer to get into it. 
uh, to get the, the nutritious part of it. And Dr. James Brubaker. I have about 2,000 types of corn that I work with. They're in a freezer out here. Corn, of course, evolved in the tropics. And you go back 5,000 years and it looked like this. This is very early corn. Very, very early corns. Every kernel. Each kernel has its own husk. And it's almost impossible to see them here. It sort of looks more like wheat than corn. Yeah, but if, if I cut through. And as Dr. Brubaker shows us, getting to the good stuff is not very easy. It's, it's hiding in there. Oh my goodness. Well, you, you'd find it hard to believe, but that's just one gene. That there, does that. There it is. Wow. <laughs> so when it comes to this plant we call corn, 20,000 years ago, it looked like a grass called teosinte. 5,000 years ago, it looked like this. And today, it looks like this. Weirdest looking grass ever. Humans figured out how to make all that change happen. How? Corn sex. Here's how corn sex works. Up top are the tassels. Tassels. The, at the top tassels. of the corn. The flowers on the tassels are the male part of the corn, and the pollen they release is like sperm. Among the leaves, at the end of every husk, we find the silks. Silks are the female part of the corn, each silk leading to a specific kernel, which is like an embryo of sorts. Each corn plant is both sexes. So the pollen drops on the silk, which pollinates a kernel, creating the part of corn we eat or plant to grow an exact copy of its parent plant. There are so many kinds of corn because when pollen moves from one plant to another, the cross-fertilized kernel will be a random mix of both its parents, just like we are. And it happens all the time, I guess, thanks to wind and bugs and people. So 20,000 years ago or so, humans noticed all this happening and put that observation to use, one planting after another. And those early indigenous people from the Americas, scientifically, through trial and error, took us from Teosente all the way to the modern corn that we depend on so much. Okay, but if corn never existed in some idealized form in the past, and it's dependent on human intervention, is it natural? And what about carrots or broccoli? Is all this stuff unnatural because we've selectively bred, or as my dad says, engineered it? And if engineering is the basis of pretty much all of the food we eat, then what does organic mean? What's the reasoning behind there being a separation between organic and GM in the first place? In some ways, it's almost an artificial distinction. And um, that's even more obvious if we talk about uh, the use of mutagenesis. Colin told me that over 3,200 plant varieties, lots of which are organic, were made by using mutagenesis. Mutagenesis means causing mutations to occur in the seed by exposing the seed to chemicals or some, some form, form of radiation. radiation and creates all these offspring. And then they look for certain offspring that uh, have traits that are desirable. Take a bunch of ordinary grapefruit seeds and bask them in gamma radiation. Grow grapefruit trees from those seeds. Some trees have redder fruit for some reason. No idea why, really? I guess no problem. Organic, ruby red grapefruit. And this is not what I thought natural meant. What do you think it meant? Well, I don't know, but if, uh, if radiation and chemicals were involved, I kind of would have assumed it was on your side, the GMO side of things, and uh, I just would not have expected to find chemicals or radiation in well, organic. That, that's just the tip of the iceberg. If we can't measure food's quality by what we call it, and if natural is just something we made up, then how do we choose the right food philosophy? Raul Adamchak is an organic farmer who helped me put this all in perspective. It's kind of a, you know, a short-term luxury in a way uh, to think about uh, some of the finer points of the benefits of organic agriculture when in the bigger picture uh, we have much more to be concerned about. You, you, you can't just want organic farmers to be more sustainable. You have to want all farmers to, to have the tools to become more sustainable farmers and and from what I can see so far even with the limited number of genetically engineered crops uh, the growers have increased their level of uh, sustainability okay we want all farmers to be more sustainable but short-term luxury what's he talking about oh 
It turns out that this is how much food the world consumes. But this is how much food the world grows organically. That is a big split. So I can only argue for an all organic world because I live right by an organic market and it wouldn't affect my day to day life. But pretty simple numbers prove I can't even have an all organic world without starving a bunch of other people. Can we feed everyone sustainably? Yes. yes. But it will require genetically engineered technology. I can't pretend we've really talked about this until we've seen how this conversation impacts people who don't have a voice we hear that often. Okay, Dad, I will grant you that this North American part of the GMO organic conversation is just a small part of what we need to talk about. Well, now we're agreeing on something. I mean, really, Nick, if you try telling a Ugandan subsistence farmer that he can't access GMO because he should feel good by farming organically, then you'll understand why I'm so passionate about this. Yeah, 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 I could not bring myself to do that probably, and uh, there is way more to this organic thing than I assumed there was. So next episode, we take this conversation to the developing world, where this looks more like this. This is Learn GMO. Not, 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 not.